The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Thank you everyone for joining us today. This is Mari Sarmia, to Channel Manager with Next Trust Bill Flash. And we appreciate you taking your time to join us on our webinar today um, titled 10% Richer Series. And this is today we have joining us uh, Patrick Suter. Now he is known for his legal and educational experience in the healthcare industry, making him a sought after resource for clients and students alike. His primary areas of practice are related to transactional and administrative healthcare, corporate, secu uh, corporate securities, and antitrust matters. He's also a professor of healthcare studies at Baylor University School of Law, where he oversees the healthcare law program and teaches healthcare law, healthcare fraud and abuse, and regulations of healthcare professionals. Pat is also involved with the Robbins Institute for Health Policy and Leadership at the Baylor University um, Hankmer School of Business, where he teaches healthcare law and ethics and has an MBA in healthcare, administrative program, and executive MBA program. He is board certified in healthcare law by the Texas Board of Legal Specialization and has completed the training by the American Health Law Association as a mediator and arbitrator. So I wanted to welcome for the first time here, uh, Patrick Suter. So thank you, Pat, for joining us today. And at any time, if you have any questions, we will have a Q&A at the end that you can go ahead and utilize that questions box on your dashboard there or send us in a chat uh, your questions, and we will get to those at the Q&A portion of this presentation. So at this time, I'd like to turn the time over to Patrick. Mari, thank you very much, and thank everybody for joining us today. Um, as Mari indicated, wow, we're going through all of that. I, I got tired all of a sudden. I, I need to cut some things out of what I do, but uh, um, I do appreciate uh, the opportunity uh, to speak to you all today. Um, with that, I have uh, uh, the presentation today really is something that I discuss with my provider clients uh, almost routinely, and that is um, billing and collecting issues. Um, with that, the idea that it's uh, um, there are legal ways of doing it. There are illegal ways of doing it. Um, but there are legal ways to increase um, the revenue you, col you col uh, collect and uh, expedite timing on that. Because um, we do know that payers um, sometimes are very slow. You get into situations where it's just administrative headaches and dealing with uh, uh, provider relations. So, you know, with this today, I, I want to spend a little bit of time with that. And, and Mari, if you don't mind, uh, if you'll uh, go to the next slide so I can do my standard uh, um, lawyer uh, disclaimer that the information and scenarios discussed in this presentation should not be considered as legal advice. Each situation encountered by a practice will be fact specific and may be impacted by federal and state law and contractual terms that apply in that instance. And it's interesting that yesterday uh, we were having a conversation about a couple of different things and um, the, the subject matter that we were talking about was rather straight simple, I mean straightforward and simple, but when I would ask a question or, or somebody would throw in a fact, I'd say, okay, well that's different this way or that's different that way. But the, the key here today is just to kind of give you some general oversight, some recommendations, bring up some laws and contractual terms that may impact that. And, and, and with this, you get back to the idea of patient uh, financial responsibility. And in that regard, um, you're going to see here that there are contractual and legal requirements where um, a practice must bill insurance companies and the patients and any guarantors um, who've actually received the services. Um, with that, um, you know, it, you would think, okay, well, of course we're going to bill. But, you know, a lot of times you get into situations where you do bill, but you don't collect or that you have uh, issues with collecting. 
And um, Mari, if we could go back a couple of slides, I think this may be on an automatic um, uh, automatic deal. So um, with that, the question is, what do you have to do uh, in regards to patient responsibility? Of course, I'm going to build, but are there considerations that I can make in that regard? Um, and, and why is it required? And uh, uh, because there may be somebody that, that uh, comes in and gives you a sob story, or it, there may be somebody that uh, um, is just a habitual slow payer. In that regard, the question is, why is this required that I have a financial responsibility policy and what I can do in that regard? If we could go to the next slide, this is the reason why um, that you have the re responsibility. First off, for in-network services, the practice will be required by the payer provider agreements that they've entered into to actually collect that patient financial responsibility. And um, when you get into situations like co-pays and deductibles, I'll have clients that say, well, I never collect the co-pays or you know, it's too much of a hassle, or um, it's a way that I can, can uh, have a positive relationship. Well, first off, that's reducing your income, but secondly, that's a breach of the, the payer provider agreement. Um, with that, let's say that it's an out-of-network service. The practice doesn't is not part of the uh, insured's um, uh, part of the of the um, payer's program. So with that, you bill out-of-network fees. Well, in that uh, the the coverage agreement between the insured and um, and and the payer. There is a requirement that they pay for their responsibility of all the network services. And it's interesting, I've had recently several clients who did provide out of network services and the, um, uh, that the payer found out that th they did not uh, um, make any effort, they being the practice, to go after the patient for their, for their, uh, um, their fair share of, of the cost. And by doing so, the, the payer actually demanded back from these practices the monies that they had paid because the, if, if there was a breach in the agreement between the payer and the insured, where the insured was supposed to pay their fair share and they didn't do so, then the insurance company, the payer, took the position that, well, if they did not pay, they breached their contract, so they should not get the benefit of us paying for the out-of-network services, our responsibility. So with that, it was it was essentially that the, the insurance company was saying, if they don't pay, we're not going to pay, and you need to give us the money back. And, and actually, um, it, it's a valid argument that can be made. It, it was... Uh, um, several of the payers on their out-of-network charge used what would have been the in-network charge and just said, okay, well, we're just going to be, we're going to do that. We're going to be happy with it. And we're not going to charge the patient anything. And um, with that, there's a couple of payers that, that found out about it and have come after those those practices. And then finally, the federal anti-kickback statute and state anti-solicitation laws come into play as it relates to kickback. So, uh, Mari, if we could go to the next slide. So, this is a um, a section out of the 2020 United Healthcare Provider Administrative Guide, and I'm not picking on any any uh, particular payer. What I did was is that uh, I Googled it, and this is the first one that came up with this verbiage, and I just wanted to share it with you because you can see um, what you as a practice has agreed to if you're participating um, in a network with uh, with a payer such as United. So with that, member financial responsibilities are, uh, uh, um, are responsible for paying their co-payments, deductibles, and co-insurance. You can collect co-payments at the time of service. Then it talks about how to make sure that you, that you actually do determine um, what is due, that you make a good faith effort. 
And um, but and if with that, you make this good faith effort, you estimate it, and then you're responsible for collecting it. And that also that if you have collected more, you have a uh, obligation to refund the money. So with this, this is right actually out of the provider guide that says this is your responsibility. And if you do not do so, then you have breached your provider agreement. Mark, you go to the next slide, please. Okay, for out-of-network services, I talked about them uh, just kind of globally in this idea that the, 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 the payer and the insured have the, this contract and the practice is actually the third party beneficiary to that contract. But if the insured does not carry out, they're part of the deal that they that they'll pay their fair share. That's where you have a breach of contract and the practice that can come back on the practice. Um, and, and with that, the insurer is assuming the patient will be billed and pay the remaining balance. Now, with this, Separate and apart from that argument about the third party beneficiary, there are state insurance and common law fraud concerns that uh, state insurance law will state that if this is part of insurance coverage, it must be carried out. Also, it's looked at that that not necessarily the, the practice, but the patient is committing fraud by not paying their fair share. Um, ERISA uh, it may be implicated that that requires uh, the the the, the uh, patient responsibility and and more importantly is the tortious interference claim and and what this is is actually a claim against the practice that if they did not attempt to collect the patient responsibility they are interfering in the contract between the insured and the payer. So you can see here where there, there is, um, um, if the payer doesn't pay, ultimately it comes back on the practice of being the one that uh, is ultimately harmed in this situation because of having to pay monies back or a denial of, uh, of uh, the claim for out of network benefits. Next slide, please. Now, this is a big one. And with this, this is fraud and abuse, the two nastiest words in healthcare. And the, the regulators at both the federal and state level take the position, and, and it's correct, that not requiring the patient to pay their fair share when required, either in, in network or out of network, essentially is compensating them to come to you, the practice. It's, it's essentially a kickback. And that's the reason why I noted the federal anti-kickback statute that deals with federal health care programs. But I give you an example of a state anti-solicitation law, which is equivalent of, of, to a kickback law. So with Texas, it's, 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 uh, this is directly out of the statute. A person commits an offense if they, if they knowingly offer or pay to, or agrees to accept uh, remuneration in cash or in kind from another for securing or soliciting a patient or patronage for or from a person licensed, certified, or registered by a state healthcare regulatory agency. Um, vast majority of states have similar types of statutes. I just wanted to give you an example. So, you know, you're looking at here. Um, different contractual claims, different tort claims, and fraud and abuse claims if you do not attempt to uh, make reasonable collection efforts. And if we could go to the next slide, um, we'll talk about that. Okay, so with that, you bill it, it's owed, you have to make reasonable collection efforts. And people say, what are reasonable efforts? Well, you should have the, a process that is followed with anyone, regardless of the patient, the insurance, whatever. And, and you may have heard, okay, we bill them and we then send two follow-up letters trying to collect and that's our reasonable efforts. And many in, in healthcare say that, that 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 is sufficient and uh, um, I can't argue with that as long as it is reasonable efforts, okay? Um, but th there should always be 
um, uh, collection activities that will continue until there's a resolution. And, and, and with that, um, that's where you get into financial assistance policies. You, you get into the standard operating procedures that um, that you'll have because then if you don't collect, you have at least demonstrated that you have a standard operating procedure by which to collect and you just didn't weren't able to. And that protects you from the first five minutes of what we talked about today. So if we can go to the next slide as to a financial responsibility policy. Um, so discounts, and you're gonna see here, there's a difference between cash discounts and let's say uh, discounts for those who, who necessarily have been billed and then show that they can't uh, afford to pay it. But usually in those situations, Every practice, or it's not usually, but it is recommended that every practice has a financial responsibility policy. Um, with that, that sets forth in a non-discriminatory manner how you're going to be able to apply discounts or enter into um, uh, terms for payment over time, something like that. Um, because we do want, to, we do not want to show that we're favoring one group over another. Because if you do that, then you truly don't have a financial responsibility policy. Um, but a practice must not use discounts again to induce referrals. Uh, uh, and, and or influence a patient's choice of provider um, and, and not provide automatic or routine discounts. Because again, that's going to look back, look like you're trying to incentivize a uh, person to, uh, to, to come to you rather than somebody else. So how, are, how can we do that? Mari, if we could go to the next slide. There are five different points, and this is really where we get to, I had to lay the groundwork um, as to getting to these points on ways to improve revenue in a legal and compliant uh, um, uh, uh, methods. And here you're gonna, we're gonna talk about point of service collection, cash discounts, telehealth, improved contracting methods, and then finally the financial responsibility policy. So if we'll go to the point of service collection. This is, uh, um, Mari, if we could go to the next slide. Um, this is also known as time of service or an upfront or front end collection. And essentially what you have is that the practice is asking for payment for the service um, sometime before the, the, the service is rendered. And that's the reason why many of y'all may have at your front desk that payment in full or your patient responsibility is due at the time of, uh, of the appointment or you know before they leave that day. Now, and it's important that you truly follow that. If you say that it is due, then you have to do something to indicate that you're attempting to collect money. And um, so it can be, you know, solely the out-of-pocket amount, um, deductible co-pay, co-insurance. But let's say somebody says, I don't have the money today. Well, you can set up a payment plan there. I, it's, this, this is an example of many times people want to pay, and especially nowadays in, in, the, in the era of COVID and people losing their jobs and losing insurance coverage and the like, that they want to pay. And if you approach them and get a payment plan in writing, my experience has been, is that those who, are, who um, uh, will enter into those, the majority will at least pay for some period of time. It, it may not be that they get to the end of the time and they've paid everything off, but at least you're getting money coming in the door for those rather than rather trying to run it down. So, you know, either asking for payment in full or offering a payment plan in advance, if they say that they cannot pay in full, is something that you should consider. Um, you know, and with that, an example one time is looking back in um, looking at accounts receivable for a client of mine that we uh, we had purchased a healthcare provider, and there was a ton of old AR, and so the the my client, the new owner, told the staff reach out to people and ask them 
if they could pay ten, fifteen, twenty-five dollars a month, would they do that? And it was surprising the number of people that did do that. And our collection ratio was actually more than a hundred percent because we were collecting a lot of AR that ordinarily people may not have been able to pay at one time, but now they can pay. Or, yeah, we can find five, ten, fifteen, twenty-five dollars a month, and it adds up. So. You know, that can really be low hanging fruit just because somebody has not responded to a bill and a couple of follow ups. Um, you know, I would urge you to, to, you know, spend some time reaching out to those people and seeing if they, whatever they can pay that they w will be able to pay. So next, uh, you know, so that's point of service is getting it up front and everybody likes to be paid up front. Well, Mari, let's go to the next slide and talk about cash discounts. Now, I want to differentiate cash discounts here from if somebody cannot pay and you're going to discount it to get them to pay. Because in that case, you really have gone through your financial responsibility policy to determine whether they truly can pay or not. But this is the idea that, that we're going to give them a prompt pay discount and with that a discount of 15 to 20 percent off of charges offered to eligible patients here which we'll describe that in a second but with that i i have practices that will give much steeper prompt pay discounts and the and then the 15 to 20 percent and there is governmental guidance out there as how you de determine what is an appropriate discount now the idea here is that there's an administrative cost of working a claim submitting it following up all of this think about it what a billing and collecting company does and so the government's saying well if you can get paid and you're saving that money as part of the practice then um then having to spend time dealing with an uh, with an insurance company we will let you offer that that administrative fee cost uh to the uh, uh to the patient to get money up front and then you don't run afoul of those areas that I mentioned earlier, whether it's a, a, a breach of a contract or a fraud and abuse concern, because you can tie back that discount to what you're saving. So, you know, with this, um, an eligible eligible patient, this definition really covers those that can afford or those that, that maybe want to pay and get the discount. Um, but so with that, it's important that as and when offering this one to, for it to be part of your financial responsibility policy, that we will offer a cash pay uh, discount or a prompt pay discount for those who want it. And this is how we're going to document it. But you, as part of documenting it, you need to make the patient aware. We are not going to submit this claim either. It is up to you. You can submit it, but it is up to you first to determine whether you, uh, um, whether it will be applied to your to your out of pocket or, or to, your, to your deductible or to your maximum out of pocket that's going to be dependent upon the payer and and the way they view those things but you have to put that in writing to them that they need to be the you know you pay us and it's up to you on what you do with your insurance company um now, with that, you have to be careful also on the amount of the reduction because if you if you provide that cash pay discount to everyone, um, for all the, all the, or at least to offer it to um, everyone tied back to a payer that has a most favored nations clause in their contract with you. A most favored nations clause means that if you routinely offer a price that is cheaper than what the payer will reimburse you, that they, the payer 
can take advantage of that lower cost that's lower than their fee schedule. So that's another reason why you do not want to have deep discounts here is the fact that it can come back to, to, to pop you later on when it turns out that or the, the payer would ordinarily pay $100 and you've been uh, doing discounts at $75. Well, if the payer gets wind of it, then the payer is going to exercise their rights under that most favored nations clause. So cash discounts are a really good way for to get that money up front. It gives a benefit to the patient um, that they, they are not out so much money. Maybe it, it, maybe that the, they know they're not going to meet their deductible this year. And so this is a way to, to, to save on that. So it's really a win-win and it, and it is legal legal as long as you apply it on a on a consistent basis you don't do it with one payer over another or one group of people over another okay Mari let's go to next to telehealth and many of y'all in your practices were probably forced to utilize telehealth um, but this is this is something that um, I've had a lot of practices that were investing in telehealth uh, platforms prior to um, to the COVID, where we had a lot of practices having that's really the only way they could see patients was through telehealth, but through co chronic care management and the like, but also as a convenience to the patients and and. With COVID, there has been a relaxation in regulations as to when you can and can't use it, um, but payers are paying for it. And it's a convenience to the to the patient that they say, you mean I don't have to take off work or I don't have to find somebody to watch my children to come in for such as things such as a follow up visit or those visits that um, that uh, uh, could be accomplished through telehealth and it's really the and I've and I have a lot of sophisticated clients that didn't really think that this would be an alternative uh, to apply on a consistent basis to uh, to offer to their to their patients um, because they felt well you know patients want to be in front of a doctor or may not be comfortable but nowadays people are used to it so um, what I would encourage you to do is to review your telehealth capabilities and what the payer will cover. And, and with that, primarily try to use it to schedule follow-up visits. Um, if you do so, you're not tying up a room, you're not tying up staff, you can, uh, you can um, see more patients in a day. And with that, I believe that because there's been so many initiatives from a reimbursement standpoint and from a relaxation of regulation standpoint, telehealth is low hanging fruit if you take advantage of it. And just be prepared that that um, if you offer it, you probably are going to have patients who want to utilize it on a going forward basis. You mean I can come in and I'm not going to be in a waiting room with a bunch of people who are sick when I'm just coming in to, to you know, do whatever it is. Um, yeah, it's, it's a big benefit from a patient, uh, uh, a patient relationship, but more importantly, for a financial relationship. Um, and I do think that you're going to see, like I said, that you're going to see um, payers expand the use of telehealth on a permanent basis, not just from what they, ha they have allowed during the COVID-19 um, pandemic. Next slide, please. Now, here is one that is an afterthought to a lot of providers. And that is their payer agreements. When's the last time they've been updated? What do we have more than one payer agreement? I mean, one more than one agreement with a payer. Um, had one client down in Austin that was looking at it, and they they had so many agreements. They were trying to figure out why they're getting paid different amounts from the same payer for the same type. Of, and and it turned out that the that the payer was you know, somehow a contract would be loaded up here and a different reimbursement right there. And they finally got in and realized that they had a bunch of different payer agreements and a lot of them really old agreements. So 
With that, I encourage you to review your payer agreements, but more importantly, recognize that um, it's better to, if, if you can, to negotiate through somebody that is negotiating on, a, on behalf of a bunch of practices and uh, then trying to do it on your own. They're, they have uh, more experience, they have connections on who they need to get to, but more importantly, uh, payers like to do that because they can contract with a lot of people through one source. And with that, and many of y'all may already be in these, in these organizations, but independent practice associations or IPAs, uh, this is a messenger that will, will gather all the, 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 the practices, the providers that want this IPA to serve as their contracting vehicle, they will gather all of that information and then go to a payer and say, okay, well, I have these, all of these payers who've been credentialed and uh, in this given area. And I know that if you offer X, you'll get a hundred percent of them. And if you offer Y, you'll probably get 90% and, 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 you know, offer Z and you'll get 80%. Um, and with that, they'll get the contract and bring it back to each practice. Now, you have to be careful here about antitrust issues such as price fixing and group boycotts. Those decisions on the contracts that a IPA, a messenger, will bring back to you have to be done. Uh, the decision has to be made independently. It can't be where you'll come together and say, we're not going to deal with this payer unless they give us X. Because while you you have a messenger that's working on behalf of everyone, you're still a competitor. And by saying you're not going to deal with them, or we all agree that we're not going to take anything less than X, that's price fixing. Those are both what are called per se violations of the antitrust law. There's no defense to it because it, it, it negatively impacts the competition within a marketplace. So the IPAs are a relatively cheap way of getting uh, access to good contracts. And there may be independent IPAs, there may be IPAs tied back to accountable care organizations or health systems. And I would encourage you to look at that because you'll probably find that um, that those contracts will be better than those that you've that you have negotiated on your own. And so with that, um, Mario, we go to the next slide. Um, with that, you'll see here that the focus in on improving revenue is one, getting money, that, that money paid up front, that you have money in the bank that you're not waiting on a payer. It's also uh, ensures compliance with the, your provider agreement if you're in network, the insured's provider agreement, or, uh, or coverage agreement, um, if you're out of network. You don't have to worry if you apply these collection efforts on a consistent basis. It, it can't be used as, uh, a, as some type of patient solicitation because you're treating everyone equally. But at the same time, if you have a financial responsibility policy that goes through and you look to see, okay, well, here's a person that makes X amount and they can attest that these are their costs, then you can actually offer discounts or, um, um, or otherwise give considerations to those that may not have the money at that, at that period of time. And always remember to, um, uh, to try to work out payment plans. And, and, and with that, the, the, by create, and this is all contained within your financial responsibility policy. You're going to have all these, how we apply discounts, how we uh, uh, may give uh, 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 discounts when it's in, in the instance that somebody can't afford it. Um, you know, all of these are things to, to essentially um, provide a, a, a compliance program, much like your HIPAA compliance program or your fraud and abuse compliance program. This is a way to be able to offer these considerations which can expedite you obtaining uh, reimbursement quicker. And with that, the idea of, you know, 
look to see if there are groups out there, IPAs out there that that uh, that may be able to get you better contracts. So many times people just forget about the contracts and whether they have one that's favorable or they have one. Um, here's an example as to a contract. I have another client that was originally started as, as a MD Cairo practice. And for some reason, it got loaded up in a couple of payers' uh, computers and systems as a chiropractic uh, practice. And so they were getting reduced reduced uh, uh, reimbursement, even when it was deemed to be uh, uh, MD providing it, it was a joint practice, they were getting reduced practice because originally it was set up as a Cairo practice, and these were old contracts. And, you know, with that, it's important to look at that and look to see if you can get a better, um, a better uh, uh, payer agreement, um, payer contract. So, um, and then finally, by doing all this, it provides transparency in pricing um, when, uh, and reduces patient issues. Think how many times that you've tried to collect something and it gets adversarial with the patient and then it ruins the relationship or there's a complaint made to the medical board or the insurance commission or something along those lines. Um, by, by being proactive up front and dealing with the patient, collecting the money so they know, you know, here's the charge, here's your responsibility, uh, we need for you to pay it today, or if you can't pay it, can you enter into a payment plan? You reduce the, the chances of those types of adversarial situations happening. So um, with that, it's really a win-win if you follow these steps. And, and they're probably things that you do on a daily basis, but I, what I want you to do though is reduce it to a financial responsibility policy because that's where you get into compliance and everybody knows what you need to do. So um, with that, Mari, if you can, if you can uh, go to the next slide, this may be the look that you have on your face because I just threw a lot at you in 35 minutes. But, um, with that, I, I am open to questions. Uh, let's see here. Um, so uh, can we offer discounts to organizations or businesses that are only specific to a business that might be in our building without getting in trouble in terms of being selective? Great question. So with that, um, you can offer um, those types of discounts but it has to be in writing, and I would encourage you to offer it to others that that may not necessarily be in the building but get wind of it. I would offer it to others so that there would not be this idea that it's selective. Now, um, it's not saying that if you don't, that, it, that it's illegal, um, but as long as you follow a financial responsibility uh, um, um, policy, um, then and say how we're going to vet those types of situations, uh, then you'll probably be okay. Um, but you, you know, with that, you still have to be concerned about the uh, um, what the payer agreements are going to say. So this is one of those things where a lawyer's favorite answer is it depends. Conceptually, it works but you need to dig down into it to see um, how you're going to handle it if somebody else wants to come up there. Is there a justification for, 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 uh, for allowing for the discount? And how are we going to determine if we'll offer it to somebody else? Okay, next question is, what's important to include in a financial responsibility contract for cash pay? So with that, um, for the for the uh, for the cash pay person, you're going to want to note that that this is um, a payment for this particular service. That it, with providing that, you will not be submitting anything to the payer. That it's ultimate responsibility of the patient to determine whether. Um, they can submit it and, and, and it be applied to their deductible or their maximum out of pocket. And also um, that if it is, if it's 
you need to look at your own now this is not necessarily in your contract but you need to make sure that in your contract you can actually provide it but that's the key things this is the price it's payment in full um, we have not we're not going to submit to the insurance company it's up to you to do so if you want to and it's up to you to determine whether it'll be applied to your deductible or your maximum out of pocket so essentially you're saying you're paying as we're providing you a service everything's on you and it can literally be in bullet point fashion like that uh, let's see are there any legal issues related to taking debit cards since they are tied to bank accounts? No, because generally with that, they're going to be deemed to be uh, a form of, uh, of payment that's recognized, and I'm not aware of any legal issues that come with, um, with the use of debit cards. Um, because really, you know, you, you look at uh, in reimbursement, the idea of cash sometimes doesn't mean cash like you know putting twenty dollar bills down on the table it's anything that you can that in turn can um uh that, that in turn can uh uh be converted to cash now you, you have to be careful with using debit cards because many times uh that when you do so there's a that you'll run a a charge you know, to see if it's approved or something, and it'll actually be more than uh, what the ultimate charge is. Okay, we didn't, we don't know what it's going to be. It's going to, let's say, while you're getting it done, we're going to run a, a, a charge for $100, and it turns out to be $80. You need to make the uh, the patient aware that that may be, there may be a hold on their account for $100, but it'll ultimately be reconciled. Okay. Next uh can i refuse to see a patient that hasn't paid um generally the answer is no and a, a lot of people say well if they haven't paid why should i put any any uh any um uh you know any effort in it into seeing them well the thing here is is that there is a physician patient or a provider patient relationship that is created once that the the first time that there is an interaction as a physician and a patient or a provider and a patient and that continues until it has been terminated and the termination could be that that um that the patient says i'm not coming to see you anymore or that the provider provides uh, advance notice of the termination of the payment, or it just may be that the patient has it comes in for a, a you know one one thing, and that's the the scope of the services, and with that. Um, over time, the patient doesn't come back with anything from that. That arguably over uh, over the period of time, that it is uh, uh, that it is uh, terminated, but. That there is a special duty, a fiduciary duty for a provider to be a, a physician to be uh, um, able to see a patient or to provide medical services when the patient is in need. And look at it this way. What happens if somebody comes in and, and says they want to see because of a headache and it doesn't look like it's an emergency? And um, you say, well, you still owe us X amount. Well, in that instance, uh, let's say that you don't see the patient. It turns out they have a stroke. That if you that if you'd seen the patient, you would have found out that they had an elevated blood pressure, and there were other indications that that a, a stroke may be happening or a heart attack or something. You're not going to get out of liability by just saying, "Well, they hadn't paid before, so I, I didn't see them." You have this obligation until that relationship is terminated properly. And if not, you are subject to a the tort of patient abandonment, which is a negligence claim, and malpractice for failure to exercise reasonable uh, due care and the provision of your services. So I know a lot of people say, I don't want to see somebody. Well, that's the instance when they come in there and say, we see that you owed money in the past. Um, we need for you to pay for this visit up front, and could you enter into a payment plan on the monies that are owed? Um, but that way, you've at least 
attempted to to the the process of collecting on that old money but you just can't say if somebody walks in from from a physician patient standpoint and as you, as an attorney i would tell you not to do it because you open yourself up to a lot more liability than what the cost of that visit's going to be now you after what you can always say um, okay, you need to pay coming back here. If not, we're going to send you a patient, or we're going to send you a patient termination uh, notice and start the process that way. But think about it, the cost of that visit versus uh, a malpractice claim. The malpractice claim or the patient abandonment claim is going to be a lot more costly. Um, let's see. Do I need to have another financial arrangement to keep a credit card on file? Should I have them sign an amount to charge up to? Um, you should have something in writing saying that I have a credit card and uh, that, that there's a credit card on file and that we are able to charge the amounts due for each visit or, you know, each. Um, by putting a maximum amount on there, that is probably a good practice. It is not necessary. If you say there's a credit card on file that you can charge for my visits because then the patient has given an authorization for you to charge on the card. But if it turns out that it's way more than what the patient thought, then you may have an issue there. So a couple of different ways. One, you do put a cap on it, say we will not charge anything more than $500 without your consent, or that you ha expressly state that we have the ability to, to charge a credit card for the cost of any visit that comes in. And by doing so, you had consent to charge it. And if they haven't asked for the charge, um, uh, you know, with that, you're going to have to overcome. Well, you did provide them authorization to charge your account, did you not? Yes. So um, you don't need a specific dollar amount, but you know, but and but with that, you also have to be careful that you that you're keeping that credit card in uh, in a secure environment. Uh, that people can't get access to it. You may want to have some mechanism by there's one person that, that does that or that it has to be signed off on. But recognize if you have that information, once you have it, it's incumbent upon you to protect it, just like your own. Uh, let's see. Um do I need to add a disclaimer to charges I send to patients to their smartphone that they can pay by text? Potential for hackers will let you know if we're compromised or something. Linking about hackers or ransomware, uh, I know there's insurance. Yes, there is insurance. Um, I'm not aware of any legal requirement to do so, but this is an instance of best practices um, that you would you would probably uh, you would probably suit you well to actually provide that disclaimer on anything um, where there, there's a uh, there's a chance that it can be hacked um, or otherwise that so it can be compromised. Um, now you you know interestingly your insurance company may actually require you to have something on on, on the the transmission that says that, um, but. Off the top of my head, I can't think of any legal requirement, but best practices would indicate that you want to do that um, and also check to make sure if your insurance company requires you to, to do so. Um, let's see, make sure I haven't missed anyone. Um, okay. Well, I'd appreciate the time today. Um, if you do, and Mar, if you if you could go over to the last slide, um, this uh, I, again appreciate the information. If you have any questions, feel free to drop me a, a, an email there at pseuter at grayreed dot com. Um, I know a lot of this is things that you probably do on a daily basis, but have not put them in some type of financial responsibility policy to how we're going to go about and provide discounts either on cash pay or for those that are having trouble paying. Um, 
you know, how to, to set up uh, uh, payment plans and, and how to document that and, and ways to, to collect. Um, they're probably there, but I will tell you that I, I, I have a lot of sophisticated clients that when I ask them for a financial responsibility policy, they have not reduced it in a writing. They know, well, here's this over here, so here's this over there. So with this are ways to be able to, to expedite collections of revenues um, and, and increase your collections on revenues. I would uh, One takeaway here is to put all of this in a financial responsibility policy and train your staff on it on a routine basis. So with that, um, I appreciate the time. Uh, Mari, you want to sign us off? Yeah. Thank you so much, Patrick. This has been such a great informative webinar session, um, part of our new series. And we do appreciate you spending the day with us, Patrick, and, and helping us understand more. I myself, as a former office manager and biller for a practice uh, for a few years, um, appreciate a lot of the information given. And sometimes we don't understand all of the implications. And um, it's important to understand that and know it and hear it. So thank you. I also wanted to make sure that you all knew if you go to the chat section, you can um, go ahead and click on or copy and paste our um, video that we have just giving a brief explanation about our pay services. And from there, you can also click to um, have one of our pay specialists give you a call and just go over that with you. A lot of the things that um, Pat had mentioned um, during his presentation, we actually do a lot of those things and we offer those um, solutions and opportunities for your patients. So definitely give it a look through and see what we can do to help you. All right, so if there is nothing more, we would just say thank you for your time and we look forward to speaking with you and having a future, um, another webinar for you and shortly in a few weeks. Thank you so much everybody, stay safe and healthy.